everybody. Welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pekulski. Today, you're going to learn everything you need to know about muscle building. Well, maybe not quite everything, but certainly a deep dive. This is actually going to be turned into two parts because my conversation with Dr. Scott Stevenson went long and it was amazingly valuable. So I want you to give us your full attention for the next 60 minutes today. And we're going to release part two in the very near future. We talk about Scott's training system, which is called Fortitude. We talk about his book, Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach, which I think the industry has been lacking for a really long time. We have a lot of people attempting to be coaches. We have a lot of people who uh, don't understand the process. And Scott has one of the most vast knowledge bases I've ever come across. He's extremely well-researched. His history is incredible. Um, having done his PhD in muscle building and done tons of research on creatine and muscle building in different populations, spent countless years as a professor and as a researcher. And his uh, knowledge base, as you guys will soon hear, is absolutely incredible and nothing short of immense. Um, so hopefully you guys are ex as excited about this conversation as I am because this filled in a lot of gaps for me and a lot allowed me to begin to understand uh, how Scott approaches muscle building. And it's a very, very unique approach that has a lot of scientific validation. And uh, from the outside, it actually seems that my perspective and his may be a little bit op uh, oppositional. But in reality, um, it seems as though they're actually very, very complimentary, as you guys will hear. Um, I have tremendous amount of respect for Scott Stevenson and his approach and his ability to build muscle, not only himself, but on hundreds of athletes around the world. And I know you guys are going to love this conversation. And part two, which is going to come up in just a couple of days, gets really, really deep into some really interesting topics around how to build muscle, uh, the psychology of muscle, and maybe why you should consider being your own bodybuilding coach. But you guys will hear about that uh, next time. For today's episode, um, Take out a pen, take out a paper. You're going to enjoy this, and you're going to take lots of notes. And if you do enjoy it, head over to iTunes, leave me a review, let me know how you like the show, and let Scott know by heading over to his website, which he mentions in the show as well. Without any more rambling from me, enjoy the podcast with Dr. Scott Stevenson. All right, so we're sitting here with Dr. Scott Stevenson, uh, and we just finished a fortitude-style leg training session, my first hurrah into... Uh -huh. Fortitude, man, and I really enjoyed it. It was very different than what I'm accustomed to, but I'm I'm very appreciative for you um, guiding that, Probably. taking me through your Fortitude training system, and um, I'd love for you to, to dive into what that is because I, I want people to um, check out your stuff and and uh, explore it. But most importantly. Um, I want that to lead down the path of why you discovered it. So obviously, you know, my opinion and probably the opinion of many others, you're one of the top brightest human beings in the entire muscle building and fitness space. No question, right? I, I would say. No, man. Like, listen, there's few people who have uh, the breadth and the depth of knowledge that you do, right? So you, you have the research, you have the training and the nutrition this knowledge and all these things for are... information purposes um, only. There's Statements very few people, as I spoke about before, everyone's a specialist, right? You this may have someone who's an expert in protein, you may have someone who's an expert in neurophysiology, but very few people have this breadth of knowledge. And then I think there's beauty in that because you get to then see many different sides of the coin. And that's what many people miss right now. Everyone is very, very specialized in not enough generalists, and that doesn't, that's not taking away from you, but that gives you that perspective from all different sides of the coin. Individuals on this podcast I think there's direct or indirect so much to be said for that. And and like I said, I talked to everybody in the fitness space, you think you have a medical I don't know anybody who has the physician. depth and breadth yeah. of knowledge that you do, right? And, and kudos to you, man, because you have so much passion for this stuff, and so I'm super excited about this chat. Yeah, I, I'm, I've been blessed with just curiosity, yeah. and, and then time. I started doing this when I was 11. Really? I started training when I was 11, I think, yeah. Um, so I've just, you know, I've, I've gone a lot of rabbit holes along the way. And yeah. then, of course, one of those was getting a PhD. And I started off doing animal work as a master's degree student. I work with firefighters and, and I've, I've just been, uh, I've been lucky enough in life to be able to make a little money along the way. You get paid sure. as a graduate student. <laughs> just enough to, to go down these different rabbit yeah, holes yeah. and different things. It's funny, like one of the things that popped in my head, it's very connected to this idea with fortitude training. We just had like a little bit of a, a, an insight into like one part of it, the muscle around right. part, which people sort of equate with fortitude training, but it's part of a daily undulating periodization schema where you do heavy sets, I call them loading sets. You do pump sets, which are continuous repetition and you can mix, mix those up however you like. I've got various, like reverse 21s is one people know. 
Um, you can do just partials. You could do like a set of 15 and then do partials at one end of the range of motion, partials at another end. I've got a technique people can find. It's called fives into the hole. I just made it up one day. But the idea is to develop as much of a pump and a metabolic stress in the muscles you can. And then there was muscle rounds, which is the cluster set technique that I came up with. And the thing that made me want to bring that in is that one of the things, and I just got this like literally yesterday, someone forwarded me something that was related to a story I would posted on Instagram. This older guy who says this is the most fun he's had training ever. So you take... And he's, he's like, I think he's actually he's my age, so he's 48, and he's been training for a long time. You, that's, you could come up with the, this ideal scenario of creating the perfect blend of metabolic stress and progressive overload and periodization, what have you, that just is an absolute grind and bore right. for someone to do. It's not fun at all. It doesn't make a difference. You've, okay. you've, you've eliminated the exercise psychology component of the fact that it should be enjoyable. Or you could take a program that's, you know, very simple and there's nothing special about it, but people love to do it because it's just fun. It's like going to uh, Six Flags every time you go in the gym. Right. So train harder. It'll be more successful. So you combine those things and then you've got a winner. And that's right. Like and one of the, the challenge of that is, one, it's different for every person. Two, it's different every day. So like, right. you know, it could, like today this workout feels amazing. Next week I may despise it, right? And, and like <laughs> right. trying to get into someone's psychology is a whole different co yes. conversation. Yeah. But if you could just describe what it is. So I know what we did today with the muscle rounds and we can talk about that. But what is fortitude training? Where did it come from? Uh, well, the name, of course, I wanna, you want to have a catchy name, of course. Yeah, market. Yeah. I'm horrible at marketing. That's one thing I do lack in. I'm not very good at that. But be, yeah. It's fortitude. The idea is that you, it's, and I've run into this too when I tell people, I had someone come to me not too long ago and said, um, want to bring up my legs and would you actually guide me through like they want to be the training in person I'm like well we're not going to train legs just once a week you've done that for years it didn't work so we're going to I like to do a higher frequency type, re type regime we're going to do legs three times a week they're like you can't do that I'm like no we're not going to do like 20 sets three times a week we'll drop your volume down and we'll just spread it out I'm like, oh, it just can't be done. I'm like, yes, it has been yeah, able to do that for years. Yeah, so yeah. yeah like you can go back to like the milk and squats program and the way like, you know, old school guys would train in the 40s and the 50s before Arnold basically sort of popularized the, the quote unquote bro split. People have been doing that for a long time, but that's, it's a mentality of like, oh gosh, I'm going to train my legs three times a week. I want to have to go like create that mental fortitude to go in there and do that. Yeah. So I think that fit with, um, the scenario that that you have to be ready for when you go into the training. So I basically went, and this is what the, the book's about. It's just an ebook right now. I want to come out with a, a written one because people like the, the hardcovers now I'm finding, um, where I put together all the number of the basic tenants that, um, and this was like four or five years ago, and pretty, pretty much everything stayed the same as far as the research goes to sort of optimize the different components of training. <clears throat> so... One of those things was daily undulating periodization. We've got different, I have even call this conjugate bodybuilding and kind of like conjugate training with powerlifting. Mm -hmm. People will do different sorts of stimuli to try to produce greater strength gains. Well, with bodybuilding, you've got heavy loading, you've got metabolic stress. We didn't actually do the stretching today. We, we just kind of blew that part like off. Like loaded stretching. I've got three different types of stretches actually. There's a, an extreme stretch, like a dog crap style loaded stretch. Um, what I call an occlusion stretch, where you go into a stretch, but you create the contraction isometrically. Um, and that allows you to sort of uh, create the stretch and the metabolic stress where you want it to be. It's a little more safe than holding a weight. You try to get into an awkward position, you got a weight in your arm or your hand, let's say you're doing a pec stretch. That can, that could p perhaps precipitate an injury. Requires skill, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So you can actually do like a doorway stretch and stretch the pecs in that same way. Um, and be more directed with it. And that's an auto-regulated um, phenomenon as well. So you basically figure out what feels right on that given day. So one of the concepts is the daily engineering periodization, heavy loading, these pump sets, which I mentioned before, it's a metabolic stress. That seems to be one of the primary sort of underlying physiological stimuli for muscle growth. And then these um, cluster sets, the muscle rounds, which we did work pretty well too. Clusters are amazing. Yeah, they're really yeah. fun. There's lots of ways to do that. Yep. So underlying all of those, one of the things that I have I have found, and this is more of a kind of an empirical thing, but I noticed this like many, many years ago, uh, there was a system that I did when I was in high school where you would do like sets of eight, seven, six, five, adding like 10 pounds to the bar each time. And 
you knew it happened to everyone, all the guys I did this with. Once you reached that set where you failed, you were just you were like you fell off a cliff. Something happened there that basically reduced the performance. That Something about that singular failure point kind of threw you for a loop such that you weren't going to stick to that, that one rep less per set scenario after the failure point. But if you could not fail, leave a rep or two in the tank in each of those sets, you you're fine. Do more, right? Yeah, so something about, and that was the fir my first inclination, there's something about that failure point which really kind of takes its toll. And I did a lot of dog crap training, DC training, Dante, Dante Trudell's program, yep. where you do a Widowmaker. And the idea there is like you, you creep up, you do like a 20 rep set, or you can do higher, higher rep sets as well, and you creep up on that failure point to where you're like literally right there, almost failing, like you're like kind of like we did the day when we when we did the, the kind of the cluster drop set mm -hmm. on the hack squat, and you're just like wrecking your nerve. You're basically someone looking from the outside. If you were married, is thinking, well, you're trying to make a widow by killing yourself. Right. Your, your wife's going to end up a widow because you're going to die, and this is a death set. That those sorts of sets will run you to the ground. But one thing you can do, and there's a, actually, if you want, we can kind of dive down the rabbit hole of the research literature, which kind of supports this notion. It's kind of a cool little. I would absolutely love to. Okay. Yeah. But even before we do that, could, sure. could we talk a little bit about what daily undulating periodization is? Oh, sure. Because I don't want to presume anybody knows what that yeah. is. Yeah. So it's a fancy term, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, on, on a daily basis, different days of the week in this case, or different workouts, you're periodizing your number of reps per set in sort of an undulating fashion. So up and down, like a snake would undulate or up yep. and down. So that could be, it doesn't have to be high, low, high, low, high, low. Um, it's sort of a generic term of the way I'm sort of using it. So you have one day where the reps are low, the weight is high. You have another day where the reps are high, the weight is low. So that'll be the loading sets and the pump sets respectively. And the other day are the cluster sets. So it's actually three set types that so, you undulate and through. And you're suggesting doing this every other day. So within this five day week, you would maybe do uh, one of each? Actually, it's, you train four days a week. Okay. So, and you're training your whole body three times a week, the way I set this up. So that's another one of the tenets is this high frequency regime. But the volume has to be, in each workout has to be such you can recover. Right. If you're not recovering, then you're not gonna make progress. Right. So that's the name of the game. So. You, when one day you would do, let's just look at legs, for instance, thighs, quads, and hamstrings. You would do heavy loading sets on, let's say, a Monday. You come back on Wednesday, and in that workout, you do the pump sets, and then you come back on a Friday, and you do muscle rounds. And the way I've set it up, just to have some basic structure, is with three volume tiers. This is another basic thing that you've probably seen, is that the extent to which people can recover is all over the place. Right. Some people, like, especially women, we're finding out more and more they, they, they recover really, really well. Their muscle soreness is, is less than men on average most of the time. Um, some of the uh, hormonal perturbations aren't as bad. Women, they just, they just can handle things a little bit better. The muscle endurance is a little bit better as well. So there's also huge variability amongst just people in general. I've seen guys who are like some of the biggest and best bodybuilders who just train like animals. And in the fortitude training uh, structure, they can only handle the lowest volume tier, partly because they train so hard. Right. They just can't recover from that. They couldn't go with higher volume. Have you so, looked at the genetic components of that? <sighs> that's a good question. Yeah, I, I think some of it's probably genetics, but I don't know what, what, what I don't know that anyone has looked specifically at that. Right. Um, it's a matter of how hard you can train, and that's some of that's probably psychological. Sure, but you know what? I, I, yeah. So here's my anecdote. Yeah, please, anecdote. Please. Like I've been able to train with a lot of pros. Right. And I always got exponentially more sore than everybody else. Like yeah. I would train with guys and we do the same thing. Right. And for, for months, yeah. and I would be sore for four days and they would come back the next day and be like, I'm good. And I was like, okay, what am I doing wrong? Right. <laughs> same protein, same hydration, yeah. like, you know, probably yeah. very, very similar protocols. I just get more sore. Right. I don't know why. Like mm -hmm. if, if it's genetic, if it's maybe my perception of, of the dis discomfort or if I'm actually creating more muscular damage during the workout, there's so many things that could be there right. or if it's genetic, genetic component. Yeah. I, I get tending. I'm so, I've been, I tell people I've been sore for decades. Yeah. I'm all, yeah. I'm it's the sore. default, <laughs> yes. but I'm not sore if something's it, wrong. It's like, I don't know. I can't remember the last time I really wasn't sore somewhere, <laughs> you know, at least when right. you stretch, you're like, okay, I'm sore still. Yeah. John Meadows, who we both know pretty well. Yeah. John doesn't get sore. Like he almost never gets sore. 
We trained, I think it was not this year, the year before we trained at the Arnold. We did we did chest and shoulders one day, and he said, oh, I, I got sore from that chest workout. Those it's damn great. donuts, man. I guess the donuts, <laughs> yeah, there's some of the power of the donuts. Like maybe, he's got a gene, like maybe he's got a gene that's turned on by something in donuts. I don't know. <laughs> but um, Or pancakes. Could be he's a pancakeologist. Yes. Maybe you have to bring him in on that. Right, exactly. But, yeah, there, there's something there. I mean, gosh, it could be anything from – you know, polymorphisms in like the cortisol receptor right. or um, something related to you know, the inflammasome and what's going on there with muscle inflammation thereafter. Um, there's so many different things that could be a play a role there. I think some of it is just how hard and you're will you train hard. You know, you're willing to go I, there. I, I you used know? to. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. You, I mean, you still do. It's like you, you can't like. You can't go back to just train like a normal person. You just your mind wouldn't let you. I presume right. like it's it just your 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 average point of like that was a decent effort is so further along the line than anyone else because it's been right. you know way off the charts. Yeah, perceived effort is very. I say that to everybody now because I'm so much more in tune with my nervous system and my breathing. Right. My perceived effort now is a fraction of what it used to be because I can stay so much more parasympathetic between sets. Right. So like even if I'm getting really sympathetically aroused, I'm back. To normal within yes. 30 seconds that I'm ready to go again. Yeah. Bring an average person in there and do that, and they're going to be just laying on the floor, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I did a lot of um, a, a great story. I've told it on a couple podcasts, but it's a really phenomenal story. Um, did a lot of muscle soreness studies when I was in grad school. Um, we did some of this stuff for like Procter and Gamble, some mm -hmm. industrial stuff. We did stuff with older folks um, because one of the issues, like for instance, with older folks is if they go and train really hard, they're very susceptible to muscle damage. And if they're really old, if they're elderly, they could actually start to exercise to keep from falling, for instance, and fracturing hip, and then increase their likelihood of falling because they're so sore because right. the muscle's been damaged. So along those lines, we we would we had a big study where we were doing some like eccentric base leg presses with people, and then we're doing like um, what's called pressure ergometry. So you we trained the trained the quads. We we basically broke down the quads, injured the quads from a muscle injury perspective, and then. It, press on a certain spot on the quads with the amount of pressure and say, what's, what's your pain rating on a 10 centimeter scale, 100 millimeters, like from zero to 100. And we were also doing muscle strength measurements too. So people were going down the line, getting strength measured and getting all these subjective scales. And there was one young guy who had trained, he was with a group of people with similar, we, we clustered them together. So the strength measures were the same. And you could sort of see, like you could compare we blinded as best we could. We're just looking at like hundreds of people. So you kind of see what's going on. And this, this, this young kid's strength got whacked. We dropped his strength less than, it was less than 50% of it what it was previously. Very, very, so he had been, there was some damage that went on there. And when I did the pressure measurement on him, most people are getting like 30 or 50, sometimes 60 out of 100. Like, ow, that hurts. Like, okay, that's, that's a lot of pain. His was like, it doesn't hurt. And I'm like, there's like no pain at all. He's like, it's like, I guess maybe a little bit. I said, well, just do your best to give me a rating. So he put his, the line like as close to zero as he could. It's like one out of a hundred. Like he couldn't have, his line was like the thickness of the, the line where they drew with the pencil right. or the pen. And I talked to him, I had a chance to talk to him later. I said, As, have you had some interesting, painful experiences in your life? Like this is when it was all said and done. He's like, yeah, I was kind of a daredevil when I was a kid. I'm like, oh really? He's like, yeah, I did like BMX, you know, I broke a lot of bones and that kind of stuff. And and I had some heart issues too. They, I had open heart surgery like twice or three times where they cut through his rib cage, which is really, really painful. So he'd gone through that. And he's like, and once I was trying to jump my BMX bike over this wrought iron fence and I, and I hit the fence and I didn't quite make it over and I impaled myself. Like this is like from a horror, <laughs> horror flick. Right. And he, he said, I was there for like an hour before anyone found me like wailing. Like that, that's painful. So for him, like you made his quad sore. Perception. It's like, oh, that doesn't hurt. Right. It was all relative to him. So right. that is part of it too, I think, you know, and that, yeah. that, will, that will come out in how hard you train, the effort that you put forth, and then how much soreness you get. So that's, that's just one piece of the puzzle, I think. And I was also talking to someone yeah. yesterday actually about, you know, maybe at some point throughout your career, you've experienced this idea of like, you know, you go get a deep tissue massage. And if you haven't done it in a long time, really, really, like you're, you're kind of squirming a little bit. But for me, like throughout my career, 
there was a point where you could do you could do anything like you could get Rolf you could you could do all those really deep tissue right. massages I could have a nap right. like I would fall asleep so like no matter what I was doing I was very you know I believe it was just more of a parasympathetic state like my brain was just turned off and I could you, you could do literally anything you could stand mm -hmm. on me and I'd be able to sleep through it right mm -hmm. so just my, my pain tolerance was that much higher yeah. my disgust I mean, it's pain it's maybe just sympathetic tone is, is less in the right. muscles right yeah well there's some interesting hypnosis literature too like sure. um, there's a I, I wrote an article for lead FTS I know you've been out there with Dave and, and John yeah. and guys and yep. um, this it did its things in this particular study that you couldn't do anymore literally they were it was something like uh, it was by a Kai and Steinhaus is published in 1960 and it was um, psychological influences on the expression of human strength and they had people pulling like basically like a preacher curl elbow flexion isometric maximal effort and while they're doing that they would sneak up behind them and scream at them <laughs> And they, they took like a fire a gun like a starter pistol and <laughs> shot that and like and see how much they could frighten them. Right. They they gave them alcohol and see what that happened there and they gave them amphetamines <laughs> as well. <laughs> and it was the idea to disinhibit all those things that limit strength, and they actually hypnotized them. Um, and this was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology, which is a really well known, sure. respected journal, and. To document their hypnosis, they took the person that the hypnotist deemed the least amenable to hypnosis and hypnotized him and told him under the, under the state of hypnosis that he was, they were going to uh, touch a hot poker to his hand um, just so he knew it was happening. And when they did that, he actually blistered. This is what it's written in the methods section. He, he got a blister on his hand. But they never touched it. It was a pen. There was no poker. There's, there is no, I mean, this is like voodoo stuff. There's right. no, I mean, it's just like, I have the paper at home. It's like, I didn't, I'm not making this up, but yeah. it, they, they, I don't know, that wouldn't even make it through the reviewers now. Like they, they just wouldn't believe it, right. but there's no mechanism for that. There was no physical damage due to heat to bring about the inflammatory response or anything that would cause a blister to happen. It was just a pen. There was no, there's nothing. It was like, it was like just, we're going to cut you with a knife and all of a sudden, just like the, the knife, knife mark appears. How does that happen? That's right. like, that's pretty crazy. So, mm -hmm. and that was the, in this case, they actually hypnotized, they had like a world record holder power lifter and they actually produced some strength gains in him, but it wasn't as much as they had in the other people who they hypnotized as well. Wow. So he was able to disinhibit through the course of his training, at least that's what their conclusion was, um, to a larger extent than most people. Still, the hypnosis had an effect on him. So the mind is a powerful, powerful thing. Yeah, and I talk all yeah. the time, again, not going down that rabbit hole, but the idea of yoga and meditation for me, how much it's improved my ability to go deeper into those sets when I really want to. Sometimes my energy systems, as you saw today, <laughs> just weren't cooperating. But right. if, I, if I actually am well-fueled, yeah. I can go much deeper than I ever... Like, I could go pretty far in the past, but now I'm actually kind of embracing the pain, whereas before I would, like... You know, be very uncomfortable with it in the deep depths of the hard set. And I'm yeah. just embracing it, man. And, if it, and you can go so much further. You don't 30% more, like subjectively. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole yeah. too much. What okay. I want to do get get back to is is this brilliance of, of fortitude training. Hey guys, just a quick interruption of the podcast with Dr. Scott Stevens to tell you about hypertrophymastery.com, my most recent program, which is all about teaching you how to build muscle for your body. So you stop mindlessly watching people on YouTube and Instagram and thinking that because someone else has a great body part, you should do it that way too. And the reality is you're built very differently than me. You're built very differently than Scott and you're built very differently than everyone you're watching on YouTube and you need to learn how to do things for yourself. So for someone who has any bit of pain, whether that be actual pain injuries or any pain around not being able to build a quote unquote weak body part, I suggest you to head over to hypertrophymastery.com and pick that program and right now because this is the foundation of muscle building to allow you to build muscle now and for the rest of your life. It's absolutely imperative that you lay these foundational movement patterns. You learn how to do things correctly for your body and your structure. And I teach you that all in hypertrophymastery.com. If you haven't already picked it up, do it now because it's awesome. You're going to love it. And I can't wait to hear your feedback. Back to the show with Dr. Scott Stevenson. So the sounds of it, from my perspective, is that you're, you're challenging all the, the mechanisms of muscle adaptation. So you're challenging the nervous system on Monday. It seems like you're doing a metabolic stress on Wednesday and then a, a muscular stress primarily on Friday. Yeah, the, so the muscle rounds, in, within each of those, the idea is to shift the focus to muscular stress and away from the nervous system stress, per se, because that then carries over to end, the endocrine system, Yeah. overtraining the immune system, 
you get, tend to get sick more easily, that sort of thing. And part of the rational the thing that I, I sort of, um, that I've looked to as far as that is that you can look at animal models and see tremendous muscle growth with things like a, as a compensatory hypertrophy model mm -hmm. where, and they've never do this in people, those are little inter some interesting literature where they've kind of done it in a way where these animal models they do this with rodents, mice or rats usually, so they'll cut the soleus for instance and look at the gastroc and watch it grow. And in a matter of months you can get like an 80% increase in gastrocnemia sure. size. That's far beyond what you would ever see with any type of resistance training. But you've also got animal, there are, also, there are actually like rodent models of, re, of weight training, where they'll strap like backpacks on the rodents or they've got a particular um, model where they use e-stem and they can do plantar flexion with rats, like in a calf press type of scenario. And you get the same relative increases in muscle size with those rodents as you do in humans when they're doing progressive overload resistance training. So the animals respond, humans and rodents respond roughly the same way to resistance training, but you can get much more growth in these rodents um, in the muscular system with these extreme models of muscle growth that you really can't evoke in humans. Although there was one study I found, it was a pretty cool study, um, they took and people who had torn their Achilles. And so they don't have normal plantar flexion. They take they took the flexor hallucis longus muscle, which normally flexes the big toe, mm -hmm. and they attached that to the calcaneus. So it's tendon transfer scenario. So those people can now walk. And there's a large variability there, but they're I think the highest um, increase when they're comparing the injured side versus the non-involved side was like close to 100% increase in size of that flexor hallucis longus muscle belly right. in an MRI. So that's just like walking around. So the muscle can grow that much. And that was in, the, it's like about a year's time. They just looked at them post-surgery a year. So we have this incredible ability to grow muscle um, in a way that you could never evoke with resistance training. That's an all-day affair. Those animals are walking around with the cut soleus. Why do you say you can't evoke that with resistance training? Well, because the stimulus is an all-day thing. They're walking around. It'd be like going into the gym. Maybe you just need and, more frequency. Well, that, that's, that's one of the reasons. But they're doing this all day long. It'd be right. like going in and bench pressing and squatting and deadlifting like all day. But like it would have to be so sub-maximal that it would, your body it, would just... It, it would be, yeah, it would just be like you can't... People do that um, with manual labor, for right. instance. Sure. But they don't get that big because you, you can't train that hard. Um, well, I think it's because your, your body would distribute load, right? Rather than like it, you put the, the flexor hallucis its longest in there and all of a sudden you can't it's, transfer. It's, it's the only it, thing that exactly, can do the work. Yeah. So you can't, you can't replicate that, that muscular stimulus on a full body Maybe you level. can if you just isolate things a little bit more effectively. So there, there's pros and cons to isolation too. No doubt. Right. But, but, maybe. but all day long. Maybe, but but may, day. does it have to be that? Maybe it could just be, maybe I do it every day or maybe I do it twice a day and it'll evoke the same stimulus. I mean, the time yeah. is probably the most subjective variable of it all, right? Well, here's the thing. There's, I've never seen anyone, people have actually talked about this when I did the mind pump episode a few months ago. We, um, uh, one of the guys had said that he actually kind of tried that a little bit, like with this with one exercise and he could get good growth, but on the whole body level. Yeah, so, completely different. Yeah, yeah, if you think about like the loading but, history. But maybe you just do one body part every six months. You could, you could try that and try to maintain it in some way, yeah. yeah. But you'd be doing, like, literally, like, think about the loading, like, on that flexor lucis longus or, this, or the gastroc. Like, literally, those animals, they, they start to walk around. They have normal locomotor patterns in a matter of a few days. Mm -hmm. So they're just loading the bejesus out of that. Like, constantly load, load, load. And it grows tremendously. So you'd have to, like, be, like... <laughs> like lunging everywhere and doing push-ups constantly and, and squatting and, and doing a thing that would, would drive you to the hole, you'd be absolutely exhausted. But is, is it a factor of the, the amount of time that it's being, like how it's very subjective, right? Like is, right. It, is it a factor of, hey, it's been, you know, we've been doing this for 12 hours a day or is it just maybe you could do it once a day or twice a day and still get a relative similar response, well, it, right? It, it doesn't happen when people train that way. They don't grow with that rate. But, but who's who's ever trained every day or twice a day the same body part with perfect isolation, right? I actually but, have a, a friend who did that. He did really? he, like he bench pressed every day for years. Yeah, and he got pretty strong, but it wasn't that rate of muscle growth. Um, and literally, I mean, even if it's one training session, um, and like compare that to uh, loading. Let's do a test, man. Let's do it. 
<laughs> uh, you, you you go go for it. But ima- imagine I'm going like, to go just, my forearm flexors. Right there, there you go. Right the but it have to be a continuous like literally all throughout all day long. <laughs> so that's the thing. And then like and then but it's every muscle group. So right. so the limit. Imagine if you tried to, if you tried to do replicate what was happening in the gastroc, walking around like you know, like let's say you're on your feet five hours a day. Right. In every muscle group. Your nervous system would be just shot. You'd make right. it like two days, and you'd be exhausted. So when I was beginning bodybuilding, I tell the story that I trained gastroc every day for five years. Yeah, and, right, right, right. And uh, the guy, one of my one of my best friends, who's right, right. now passed away, said um, the reason your gastroc is so big is not necessarily because you train them every day. It's because your feet are so effed up. <laughs> Right, so that's kind of the same thing. So normally, you're, I mean, maybe because I train them every day, but my feet, because I wore you know these very hard shoes, mm. instead of making it you know the, the typical pronation pattern of your feet, uh-huh. it was literally slap footed. So it was just literally plantar flexion, plantar flexion, plantar flexion. So rather right. than the natural you know pronation pattern that would normally happen, so my my ankle just basically moved in unison as one. I had zero <laughs> foot function. Okay, so that. In his eyes, was like, dude, you're walking on that thing all day long in this plantar flung, f- flexion, dorsiflexion pattern right. that has absolutely no inversion, eversion at your ankle, yeah. that, and you're pushing 300 pounds. That's right. why your gas struck with the way that yeah. it's kind of a similar. And, and actually, I'm glad you brought that up because look at some like um, uh, wrench monkeys, as they call them, like like mechanics. Who are, forearms. Yeah, they're yeah. constantly doing that. So that right. so that's the thing. If you tried to like for a bodybuilding perspective, replicate that in the whole body. That sort of you could do one body part at a time. You could, but 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 here, here's the point though: is if you want to grow the whole body and not look like Popeye, so to speak, or 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 like just be overly developed in one place, you, eventually your nervous system would 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 sure. run it. And that's then that was the that, and that's where I'm leading to Perfect. with fortitude training. Yep. Is that um, your muscle the muscular system can handle a tremendous amount of stress that and the nervous system is sort of the weak link, so to speak. And those two things, um, your skeletal. I mean, assuming you don't break bones, you're not worried about the skeletal system. So we've got musculoskeletal nervous system, the three kind of involved, and endocrine and immune being connected with the nervous system because they get involved once the nervous system's stressed. So that's why I keep those failure points out to a certain degree, because so, those are the ones. And this is just sort of an empirical thing, like we talked about when we were training, is that it's those reps, those grinder reps that just wear you down. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that make you think, okay, I need a nap. Like, I Mm -hmm. just want to go home and lie in the bed, turn off the lights and shut everything down. But you can, you can, you can accumulate volume, like with the muscle rounds is a perfect example of that, where you, you work your way through those, the, the cluster set until you have one failure point. And then you drop the load back down, refocus your form, refocus that mind muscle connection and then do some more volume there but you keep it to one failure point as opposed to like and this is nothing against dc training because it works phenomenally well but there's three failure points in that rest pause set or like with the widow maker you're like you're you're grinding yourself with those failure points so when i have people do loading sets for instance in fortitude training and let's say they're going to do the high volume tier and they're going to do like a squat for the thighs they would only take the last of three sets of those loading sets to failure. The other two would be one to two reps in the tank. Still hard, but there's something like, there seems to be like an exponential increase in the quote unquote, to borrow the Mensarian term, the inroads that you get when you go to failure. You leave a rep in the tank, like that was tough, but I didn't like push myself to that blinding, like, oh my God, like this is all I got. That is what eats you up. So that's, I've tried to incorporate that in all the set types and afford to, even the pump sets is you, is you, you keep continuous repetitions. You don't pause, you keep continuous tension, so to speak, because when it's when you stop, and then you get some muscle recovery, and then you can keep going again. You mm-hmm. can like, you know this, like if someone said, okay, Ben, putting a gun to your head, you know, you're, you're, this is, it's all on the line. I want you to make this set last 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. You'd, you'd make it last 100 minutes. Sure. You would. <laughs> but if you had to keep moving, eventually you would, you would grind to a halt, and that gives you sort of one failure point in there. So that's an important part. Yeah, of I, lo- I love that you brought that up because that was one of my favorite takeaways from the workout today was right. this, this idea of, one failure point and i thought that was really interesting um i think the listener could take a lot away from that right it's Mm. like pay attention to where your failure point happens but i'd like to talk a little bit more about um why that happens right because like so at certain points throughout my career again anecdotal i was completely resistant to that like i could train to absolute fatigue on 
You're unbreakable. 30 sets. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question. Yeah. And that, I think, may have been a very useful asset for me to push right. well beyond anything else. Whereas if I would have adhered to this one failure point, I don't know if it would have been better or worse. Like, who's to say? But, like, right. do we, do you, what's your, your best proposed mechanism as to what's happening there? Is it, um, you know, the lack of the mitochondria to provide energy to the, to the nervous system? <sighs> yeah. Like, um, what? That- what is? What do you think? I, just, I I'm trying to think through it. Like it, everything's replenishing itself, right? Like what would it be? Yeah, I mean, there's. It, I think it depends a, to a large part on the person. Okay. Um, so there is there is a whole body of literature which, unfortunately, comes up with kind of zero answers when they look at percent motor unit activation. Um, so that's the idea that uh, you can you can basically there are various ways you can do this. You can have someone. This is in a non fatigue state for the most part is you can have someone do a maximal effort, like a maximal voluntary contraction. And then you can superimpose upon that contraction, let's say they're doing a knee extension, and you superimpose upon that, um, even it could be a super, lo- super physiological electrical impulse, either to like the femoral nerve, which will activate the knee extensors, or transdermally to the quad, and see if you get some increment in force. So, and let's say, hypothetically, someone can activate 90% of their skeletal muscle. So you've, you've got some E-STEM, and let's say it gives you uh, 100 newtons of output. And so that's like with, with no effort at all. You're just relaxed, you turn on, it gives you 100 newtons. And let's say then that when you maximally activate, you're turning on 90% of the muscle mass. And then you superimpose that stimulus, and you get 10 newtons. The idea there would be that you're activating 90% of that 100 newtons, so there's 10 newtons left over, you activated 90% of the muscle mass. That's, that's the idea. Mm-hmm. And they've done studies, for instance, like, like in older folks and um, who will gain strength tremendously. You can, like, there are studies where they've tripled strength in older folks because they've been inactive in a matter of months. Um, and you almost see, you've achieved tremendous gains. That's what he's doing. No, just like regular training, training okay. yeah. So, but they'll, in these studies, they'll say the older folks have 100% motor unit activation. Well, it's like, how can that be if they get like 10% increase in muscle size and they double their strength? How, how do they, how do, if they are at maximally activating initially, how can they get so much strength gains? Right. It's not neurological. And one of the problems there is that when they use that technique, you superimpose that stem, the electric, electricity goes both directions. It can actually go, it's called antidromically. It will basically run up like a, a negative wave and impair what's coming down from your brain. And it totally throws the, basically invalidates the whole, the whole body of literature, in my opinion, is basically invalid because of that. We played around with that in the lab when I was, we had a really good STEM unit um, when I was in grad school, when I was a college professor. And you can actually, with a lot of guys, you would turn on the STEM and the force would go down. Because basically you were you were negating the downward neural activation that comes. So it's, it's as far as like testing scientifically to get to your question, how much of that is like a neurological um, limitation? Like are people just like unable to push when they get to that failure point? Is it neurological? <sighs> I don't know. Are they psychologically but, broken, right? Because that psychological it, resilience has to play a factor. Because, like, of course, yeah, yeah. So, like, if you hypnotize them, sure, you can get some more out of that. You, I mean, you, there's too many stories of women who, like, you think of the mother who's, you know, they've been in a car wreck and their child is pinned under the van and they pick the van up and save their child, or these superhuman feats of strength. Those things sure. happen on yeah. a regular basis. Yeah. So there's something there. I think there's there is a there is a, a reserve that we don't tap into in, of the, in the gym. Right. So like a beginner, you know, average person who's just moderately motivated, it's probably neurological, But, but I think there's a reason why we don't tap into that gym, but it's exactly what yeah. you're saying. Because yes. if you tapped into that, you would go into that place of absolute fatigue, right? So yes. maybe it's like a cortisol, epinephrine, like surge that when you get toward the end of that set and all of a sudden it's your body has to go back into parasympathetic. Yes. Right? Because like, you know, Exhaust it, just like saying you're lifting the car. Right. So as you lift the car, you're probably going to take a nap, yeah. right? Like <laughs> I, your, your body's going to shut you down. Exactly. That yeah. could be exactly what's happening. I, I think so. So I think, I think it's really just my, this is just, it's some of it's based on those ideas and some of it's based on like how many people, if you really said your life is on the line, you get this rep. That's it. You're you're done. You, they would get the rep. Almost everyone. Would. Well, yeah, you'd find a way to get the rep, but then the subjectivity of it for my in my world is 
I could do a rep no matter what, but is it actually getting the benefit that right. I'm looking for, right? right like in yeah. my world, I'm not looking for just completion. I'm looking for, well, how do I actually challenge the right yes. thing? And, and that's kind of where yeah. I kind of carve my own little niche compared to most people. It's right. not like completion to me is not the goal. Right. Challenge is the goal. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, well, could I do another rep? Yeah, but what's it going to look like? And, and how much does it predispose <laughs> me to injury, sloppy, right? Because right. that's where injuries happen, man. Yeah. Like if we stay in this world of like safety and, and precision of execution and, and, and effort, I think, you know, I don't, I, would, I don't even advocate most people doing those reps unless you have somebody there who's a competent spotter right. who can be there. Like if something starts to yeah. go, go south, like you're on right away, right? What you, what you want to see, I think, is what you're trying to do when you've got perfect form and a mind-muscle connection, you're connected to the, the target musculature, is that um, it's a, basically a metabolic source of fatigue. Yes. And that's the thing, like there's a whole body of literature. There's a guy named uh, Bob Fitz who's like written... Um, tremendous papers on this. Like you can look any, any anywhere from the the motor neurons in the brain, down to the neuromuscular junction, down to calcium handling in the muscle cell. Ultimately, it's a function of of uh, energy balance, energy supply, and energy demand. Right. Whether that's mitochondrial, whether that's glycolytic, whether that's the phosphagen system. At some point in time, there's some limitation in cause of fatigue. It could be. A whole bunch of things and it may not be like one particular week week it could be like multiple links in the chain so to speak breaking kind of all at once mm -hmm. but ideally you would want it to be a metabolic type of scenario Absolutely. if you've got it if you got an exercise that I think lends itself biomechanically to what you're trying to do so there's not like a huge sticking point then what you'll you mean just from a resistance profile yeah, yeah exactly so that like you know like so then like some point in the middle like it's like you just have to drive past that yeah um you would if you're if it's a metabolic source of fatigue that ends the set you would see what you see like when you have people do um like fatigue tests like when the isometric fatigue tests where the where things would just kind of slowly come to a, a grinding halt mm -hmm. so their reps would go rep 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 and if you kept them continuous let's say no no intermittent reps rep 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 mm -hmm and then they're done right that's that would tell you that there was no there wasn't their brain that gave up um it wasn't like a biomechanical thing where they get to that sticking point also there's no getting past that it's a metabolic source that's a good set right there right yeah absolutely so that's probably a function of the set too like we can we can go to where you are with your diet now yeah yeah like your glycogen levels are are not very good <laughs> Com right now comical. yeah because yeah, yeah. you when was the last time you had like a major carb up mm, i don't know three three weeks maybe okay yeah. yeah so how many times have you trained legs since then um four times in the last three weeks okay okay yeah. so but again it's low volume higher loads not a lot of sense yeah. to failure yeah right? so it's interesting that you don't i mean um i have to like they've done some of this this work with endurance athletes but your, your glycogen can kind of creep back up i don't know who absolutely are, yeah. yeah so on a ketogenic diet it can absolutely creep back it up it can yeah. yeah so with you as, as adaptive because you've been messing with ketogenic diets for a long while now yeah, for, yeah. you may have replenished some of those but you did seem when we're training to to have the sense that you're doing you're bonking a little bit yeah like where you yeah you're getting the sets and like okay i'm not getting like this crazy metabolic lactic acid type of burn i'm not getting a great pump no nope. like the muscle's just like okay just i'm done now. we're done right yeah. right and yeah. that would be that would tend to tend to suggest you've got a fuel source issue mm -hmm. like the glycogen's just not there mm -hmm. And um, that's a function of literally, um, I mean, there are limitations in those metabolic pathways as far as how fast they can provide ATP. Mm -hmm. You know, phos the phosphagen system's faster than the glycolytic or glycogenolytic system, which is faster than the aerobic system. And you've got a differentiate between carbohydrate as a source there for oxidative phosphorylation and fats, and then, of course, ketones. Right. Now, do you think that's a, a, a factor or a function of not enough substrate energy there or an inability of that energy system to produce energy because I'm not training it enough? Um, I think there's there's some, uh, and I haven't seen this, like it's has been totally like exploited to what extent you can increase, like for instance, the relative ability to provide ATP through oxidative phosphorylation from fats. Because intramuscular triglycerides, is like it's, it's the wild, wild west is how much those go up mm -hmm. and to what degree those can provide um, energy through fat oxidation. But I, I think, 
you probably your glycogen levels probably aren't great. They may be you know higher than if you had just started the ketogenic diet like three weeks ago. Right. I've been very active. Yeah. Lately, moving yeah. and such, so it could yeah. be that. But you're adapted somewhat. Yeah. But I think it's a function of you've imposed an energy demand. Just you've got those heavy weights. You're trying to move. There's just a certain rate of ATP that has to be supplied in order to keep those reps going. And my quads just stuck two middle and, fingers in the and, air and said, not yeah, today. Yeah, the only way you can yeah. do it is with glycogen, glycogenolysis. You've got to right. do it through carbohydrate as your fuel, and you just don't have the carbohydrate. You can, you, you've probably adapted somewhat so you can use fats to some degree better yeah. now than months ago, but it's just... So just, I'd, I'd love to talk then just briefly about sure. how you would suggest, some, like a lot of the... A lot of the world right now seems to be going very low carbohydrate, very ketogenic. I know a lot of my audience does. Right. I'd love to talk about how you would adapt training yeah. uh, to someone who's looking to add muscle right. on a ketogenic diet. Yeah. Um, the first thing I would think I would consider is why is the person on a ketogenic diet? Like, what's the... It's a brilliant question, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. And that's what we always talk about is like, yeah. are you attached to this dogmatic approach because you want to be on a ketogenic diet? So the answer is usually, well, because I like the way I feel right. or because it's simple. Yes. Um, right. And and so some people have high inflammation or they have you know, insulin resistance, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they correlate like, hey, I feel better at a ketogenic diet. It's simple right. for me. I'm going to do it. So what we've been actually advocating is a targeted keto approach. So like before, during, after a little bit of carbohydrate, mm -hmm. then the rest of the day you're ketogenic and people seem to kick right back in relatively oh, yeah. quickly mm -hmm. yeah but so yeah you talk about that like great yeah. question yeah i mean i i started doing ketogenic diets like in the late 90s yep um lyle mcdonald i think his his book the ketogenic diet is still it's a phenomenal resource it's still out there you can still get it, like I have it's, it yeah. yeah it's a great book so we were messing around with those and there was a group of people literally on a news group um before this was like before you had discussion boards. This was like at the when the internet was in its infancy. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, many of them had epilepsy, or they're controlling for that reason, or they had inflammation issues or autoimmune issues. That's why they're on the ketogenic diets. Now, of course, it's from an accounting perspective, it's very very easy. It's like yeah, you're just like got two things to juggle really: mm -hmm. protein and fat, and your carbs are like you know, just keep them really really low. Um, so yes, the I, I the thing the rule of thumb that I've used with folks, and it's a, maybe a little bit different with a targeted ketogenic diet, is that you don't want to train more than tw a muscle group more than twice probably if you're looking for in a week um, before you've carved up or before you yeah. have a sense that you've replaced the carbs that were used there, or you'll run into what you kind of run in, running into. So if you're trying to gain muscle mass, um, you want to be able to train hard. You want to be able to train in a progressive fashion. You don't want to go in the gym and feel like, okay, I'm kind of bonking. Like I'm, my sets aren't optimal. Um, my reps are just tailing off like that. I'm not able to progressively overload. You're going to want to have, you want to have that as sort of the key essential ingredient of your training stimulus, as, as well as with, you know, having excess calories. You have to have enough calories sure. to build the muscle. So the targeted approach is, it's great, especially if you're, there were people on this, on this group that was really quite phenomenal. Um, this is back in the late 90s. This is back in the late 90s. And I know it happens now, too. There's, there seemed to be some upregulation in the liver. They could, they could even move to like kind of an isocaloric kind of zone type diet and still at least have urinary ketones. As yep. if they sort of turned on the ketogenesis and, and it's best after being ketogenic for a long, for long, long time. time. Yeah. For sure. We talk about that a lot. It's just like yeah. once you've been in for a long time, your body just yeah. knows how to produce ketones, right? right? It's like, yeah. I don't know if that's the you know, best way to describe it scientifically, but yeah. you just... As soon as you remove the carbohydrate, you're back into ketosis. And, you know, the benefit of being in ketosis psychologically, I think, is tremendous. Right. Uh, as far as overall energy, less crashes, I think it's awesome. But I do agree from a performance perspective, there's certainly some limitations. So this, I, this is what we're playing with now. It's like how much carbohydrate can you get away with right. keeping in, like, to fuel performance and still maintain the, the psychological and psychological benefits of ketogenic diet. Yeah. So there, uh, one of the specs, you might have someone who um, maybe gets triggered by carbs. Like they get, they get a little of the ghrelin release and like when they, when they add the carbs in, they're like, okay, now I want cupcakes and pancakes. Sure. Yep. So that person has to be very, very careful. They have to be very, very structured. Um, other people, it may not matter. For instance, you might have a scenario where someone trains late in the day and the carbohydrates allow them to sleep really, really well. Absolutely, yeah. So they could, they could get away with, you know, 150 grams of carbs, um, you know, three times a week. Right, wake and, up in the morning and still be deep and, ketosis. And, being, yeah, and, yep. and not really lose anything, get a great night's sleep. 
Right. So like those are two scenarios. So as far as the TKD, it's going to depend on the person, their relationship with food, what their training volume is too. So of course, that's huge. So that that was kind of where I was going with that question. Yes, it's like yes. adjust. How do you adjust your training volume, density? For someone who is on a ketogenic diet, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna come down some to some degree probably to an auto regulatory type of thing. How often are you training? That idea of don't train more than probably twice without adding some carbs in. Um, if you're doing a, like a purely targeted ketogenic diet, and you're literally like sticking those like like when you I'll just ask you this when you when you have people doing a TKD, how many carbs are they having and how often? Completely different for everybody, right? Okay, yeah. So we'll, we'll start somewhere in the realm of just 30 to 40 grams, right. like pre-workout, yeah. see what this does. You and know, that's and just to pop them out of ketosis because they feel better when they're training or because it, it seems to extend them. the ability to produce volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, some people are up to 150 grams, you know, but with right. 75 before, 75 during, it's yeah. going to kick them out, but right. usually they're going to get back, right, right back in. Yeah. So, but it's a progressive thing, right? Right. How much muscle mass do you have? How hard do you work it? You know, like it has to be subjective, but yeah. just want to give people guidelines like, Hey, don't be so myopically opposed to carbohydrates. Like yeah. what is your goal? Right. If your goal right. is to be in ketosis, as you said, ask yourself why. Yes. Yeah. So here, here's the thing. And, and, and it's because there's so much biological interindividuality and the goals are so different. So let's say, let's say you've got someone who really loves ketogenic diets. Let's say, let's say they're even like, a, they're a sponsored competitive bodybuilder. And so the ketones are sort of part of their niche. They've got to be, they've got to do a ketogenic diet, but they want to get as large as humanly possible. It's a, it's a guy, he's five foot eight. You know, he wants to go from 220 to 250. He may eventually just simply by virtue of needing those calories need to add in the carbs at some point. He may have to go to like a cyclical, a combo cyclical targeted ketogenic diet um, where he's doing like a Refeeds full day. once or twice a week. Yeah, yeah. something like that, a, a carbohydrate based refeed, like maybe once a week and then add, adding targeted ketogenic, targeted, ket uh, car targeted carbs two or three times a week before his big work. Funny, do you know Jordan Joy? Yeah. You were just on the podcast, and he yeah. talked exactly about that. He okay. says, I'm doing targeted, and I'm doing cyclical. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so he's like, every week, once a week, he'll have uh, a big sushi meal. Right. It's always the same. He's like, this is what I like. It makes me feel good. Right. And I've been growing. I've been staying lean. I feel like my ketosis all week. I was like, it's exactly what you're saying. Right. He's figured yeah. it out. Yeah, there were yeah. guys like on this group. that They were there doing like 10-day cycles. That's, you have to look outside the box. Everyone's like, what's a seven-day week? So like Saturdays in my carb day, it's like, well, why? Yeah, not necessarily. Right. Like if you if your training and recovery suggests that, you know you, you need to use like a four day split and spread that over eight days or what have you, then you might be on like a ten day cycle for your carbs. It may you know things may and it may may be relative to what muscle groups you feel like you most need the carbs for. Um, there's also the idea. Let's say someone has, um, let's say back. Their back is what they need to grow. And so they're going to place those carbohydrates around the back training, um, maybe to make sure they got plenty of, they've fueled up with carbs so they can train back really, really hard. And then they can take carbs in before the back training. So they get that effect, that sort of ergogenic effect. And then the recovery of refilling, making sure the back muscles aren't low on glycogen. Mm -hmm. um, so they may, they may set things up around that weak muscle group as well. So it's so individual. Um, and it's relative to the person. That's goals. why we're here, though. We're trying to provide people information yeah. so they can start making these intelligent decisions yeah. rather than being, you know, myopically focused around one approach. Yeah, the thing I think it's it's a tendency, and this happens just. It's I think it's somewhat human nature. We're we're tribal. Um, zealotry is just something that's sort of want like, to follow. Yeah, yeah, to some degree. So it's like yeah. ah, I'm like you know I I hate carbs. I'm not doing carbs. I'm keto. That's that's sort of where I'm where I'm stuck. Right. And um, if you realize like, it's just a tool, you know, don't try to use a, a hammer when a screwdriver is the right tool. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need to use carbs because you need the carbs for performance and you need the carbs for calories, then use the carbs. Um, if for you, because of your work, you need to be in ketosis as much as possible so you can think clearly and you can be performing meetings and talk with people and do whatever, then you don't have to do that. You'll have to then weigh your priorities in a way exactly. that matches that. So, yep. yeah, it's hard. Like, I'm, I'm terrible at, like, give me your boxed answer. No, or man, that, that's, a, that, yeah. that's just creating that discussion. So this sure. kind of perfectly segues into one thing I want to talk about with you is um, the influences of cortisol. So um, if someone in a ketogenic diet is, um, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be a ketogenic diet, but just because we're talking about it, 
um, is training hard, they're clearly going to be producing a high amount of cortisol. Mm. What are the implications of that um, as far as your ability to recover, your ability to build muscle? Do you think that would be a hindrance? Do you think it's, it's almost necessitating the consumption of carbohydrate because you're producing so much stress from the workout? Yeah, so there's, it's, there's an interesting thing. Um, if you look generally at uh, the influence of like one of the questions people have asked is like the increase in testosterone or growth hormone. And there's a long line of literature sort of based on this underlying notion, is that important for producing muscle growth? And Stu Phillips' um, lab has, I think, done a nice job of kind of debunking that idea. Um, but there is one study which people will point to, and you have to look at this in the context, that suggests that there was, over the course of training, um, when they measured an acute workout, a relationship, or at least a correlation, between elevation in cortisol and eventual muscle growth. And, and that seems to run counter, like, what's, so what's the physiology? Yeah, yeah. Like, what's, what's physiology there? Well, the harder you train, the more cortisol you sure. get. People who train the hardest are going to probably grow the best. Absolutely. So that makes sense. Um, on the other hand, if you look at some of the nutrient timing literature, there's a study, set of studies, um, Tar Penning is the first name, and, and, and Bird, B-I-R-D, those, they work together on some of these studies um, with carbohydrates and then essential, essential amino acids and carbs. One of the things you find when you take carbs in around a workout is it reduces the cortisol. And in this, this, these are studies that were done actually in Australia, the Tarpenning studies, um, is that they found over the course of training, um, they gave it was 50 grams of, actually it was just Gatorade. Um, if you read the, they don't, it wasn't, Gatorade wasn't the title of the study, but they were funded by Gatorade, so it was Gatorade that they used, you can see it in the, in the methods is that there was a relationship between the depression in cortisol or the inverse relationship between cortisol levels around the workout and the increase in both type 1 and type 2 fiber size over the course of the training. So basically, um, there were variations in how much cortisol was lowered by the carbohydrate. Um, and they gave the same dose of carbide to everyone, or same relative dose. But those who had the greatest or the lowest cortisol levels had the best muscle growth. Hmm. And the correlations in the type 1 and type 2 fibers were like 0.7, like 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So that's like, if you look at like the whole variance, like, okay, so what's, what explains why the muscle grew here? Like if we look at all the variables and you just, this is just a very generalized statistical um, assumption, but you can take those correlations and square them and it gives you a percentage. So 0 0.7 times 0 0.7 is 0 0.49. It tells you like 50% of the reason of the variance in muscle growth was a function of cortisol suppression. Right. So the thing about that that kind of makes sense physiologically to get back to the, the underpinnings of why that would matter is that cortisol is a steroid hormone. Mm -hmm. So like androgens, they go in and the, the sort of genomic dogma of that is that they make their lipophilic, they make their way into the cell, they bind to the cortisol receptor, and then they do their magic on the genes. And that's an hour, that's a long-term process. Mm -hmm. Cortisol levels might come up and come back down, but they're still working their genetic magic, the gene expression is going on for hours and hours thereafter. So what happens in your workout and the impact of cortisol elevation during workout or not being elevated because you've had carbohydrates is going to impact muscle metabolism and cortisol increases protein breakdown for hours thereafter, like 12 hours or more. So you can see some of this from like the, um, the corticosteroid literature where they've measured those sorts of things over a period of time. So. In this particular study, it's the best piece of literature I know. The lower the cortisol when they gave, and that was in the group that's given the carbs, the better the muscle growth. So carbs before, during, after. What did they, yeah, they, they all, spread it out. I think this is the one where they they literally like they gave them aliquots of Gatorade like throughout their workout. Like literally, so I'd be very curious to hear your opinion or if you know any data on. Yeah. you know, is it important that you block the cortisol, or is it just important that you mitigate it after the? Training. So do like by taking carbohydrate before or during, I, I likely will have less of a cortisol response, right? Right. So would it be okay then that I take a, you know, if, I, if I'm ketogenic, I stay ketogenic before, during, and then just take a carbohydrate source after? Or would it be best to just try to blunt the response before it happens? I would, th I would think like literally once you've got the elevation... Um, it's doing its work. Yeah, then, then you sort of set an emotion because it, it's made its way into the cell. It's doing its, its magic or, mm -hmm. or its voodoo. Right. <laughs> it's, it's black magic, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, and that's going to happen there. So I don't know. Um, trying to think. 
the, uh, the bird study, I think, was, was a, a pre and, and during intra workout. Um, you want yeah. to probably do it beforehand. Yeah, like it makes you want sense. To, yeah, yeah. You want to keep it from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had any experience with clients or yourself, who, people who um, take carbohydrates pre workout and maybe start to get tired or lack focus? Or, or yeah. yeah, so what do we do in that case? Yeah. Uh, the, so what seems to help there, I've, I've like this happens a lot with people actually who do like a nutrient timing. Some people are like, they want those carbs in, and sort of this too must just be psychologically. They're looking for carbs, they want carbs. They're carbophiles, like, give me the carbs, please. So they get the carbs, and like, now I'm good to go. And they just take the carbs in, and then they're, then they're fine. You know, how much of that psychological, I don't know. And other people get sleepy. So those people, I, but if not, that doesn't happen if they start taking the carbs after they're getting into the workout. Right. Like, literally, once they get in that mindset, like, nothing's going to stop them. That's always how I, how I hacked yeah. it. I do one exercise that's really hard. Right. And then your nervous system's just ramped. Your sympathetic nervous system doesn't just matter. Firing now you can put the carbs in. Yeah. 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 That's what I found. So I always ask people when we if I do an intro. A lot of times I'll have. I usually use a nutrient timing approach. It says kind of like, not that it's the magical way that works for everyone, but it's just sort of a it's sort of a baseline strategy that I'll employ, really? and then kind of vary depending on how people respond. But I'll ask them that first question. It's like, does carbs make you tired? Like, I don't, last thing I want to do is like, okay, it's time for a big workout, and we're putting you to sleep. You know? you're, you're falling asleep while you're putting. Your and then they become on. dependent on caffeine and stims, and that's a whole different yeah, rabbit you're hole. Yeah, down a rabbit hole you don't want to go. Yeah. All right, ladies and gents, that's a wrap of part one with Dr. Stevenson. I hope you loved it, and if you did, I hope you come back for part two in just a couple of days. If you're not already subscribed to the podcast, gosh, what are you waiting for? Get over and do it now. It's the best podcast you're going to find anywhere on building muscle living your greatest life, optimizing performance, and just everything you need to be strong, healthy, and vibrant for the rest of your life. I am Ben Pakulski. This is the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. Head over to iTunes right now and subscribe and share this with at least one person. Why not five people who you know will love this conversation and want to build massive muscles with Dr. Scott Stevenson and myself. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.